Well, I'll go ahead. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this presentation um, about how to produce approval ready applications and reduce turnaround time. Everybody's big concern is turnaround time, and I don't blame you. Um, by doing this, it decreases our, by do, following these rules, it decreases our review time. If an application is approval ready, we can get through them sometimes in a half an hour. Um, but most applications take a lot longer they, um, because they aren't prepared properly. Um, contrary to what a lot of people believe, we, the genealogy staff does not like to pend applications, uh, but we're, we're charged with ensuring their correctness to adhere with the SAR policy of proving lineal descendants from a Revolutionary War patriot. It takes us much more time to pin an application. We know sometimes it seems like we're the enemy, but we actually want your applications to be approved and try to work with you to make that happen. Um, this has been a really busy year for us. We, um, our, our processes have been disrupted a few times. We, our, our area has, was redesigned and we had to move out of our area, our workspace area. And most of us were working remotely then because it were some of us, because it was really hard to find places that we each could sit comfortably do our work while our areas um, were being remodeled. Um, we also lost a couple of employees early in the year. We gained some employees in the summer. So we are, we spent a lot of time training them, which is, we thought was really, we think is really important to, to our processes. We've let people go out on their own in the past too, uh, too soon, as we have seen the results of those applications of errors on those applications. So we really wanted to make them totally comfortable. Um, I was out for two weeks and then mostly because of my back surgery and mostly work remotely. So there've been a, several things that have transpired. Please realize that even though, at least at the beginning of the year when Tim joins us, the three days a week he works, that all of us are not full time. There are only three, four, four of us working 40 hours a week. Uh, one work working 32, one working 16, one working 20. We just don't have, and, and uh, actually, yeah, that's right. That's right. So we, and Tim will be working 24. So it, don't think of it as eight people working 40 hours a week, because it's not. Um, let's see here. Oh, bear in mind that the that the holidays are quickly approaching. We will the SAR headquarters will be closed Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving Day and the day after. And during the Christmas holidays, we're closed on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, and New Year's Day. And um, a lot of people take vacation time at that time of year. So be aware that we won't always be here and just try to be patient with us. And I'm going on vacation in um, the end of December, the 28th, and I'll be back on the 13th of January. But I'll check my emails from Florida. Um, let's see here, uh, supplementals. Everybody's talking about, everybody's worried about supplementals because the backlog is, is so vast comparatively. You, It's probably um, common knowledge that we will always focus on new member applications because getting new members in increases the membership and increases the dues coming in. And we want to, um, we want to always do that as most lineage organizations do. We do have two people working on supplementals now. I know it's not a lot, but they are focusing on supplementals. Back when we had such disruptions in our, um, in our being able to work or having to work remotely or being here, being displaced from our work uh, stations, we focused on just new members because it, to do supplementals requires going in the vault and getting previous files out. And there's, uh, it's just not work. It just doesn't work uh, well to do that and take all those home to work remotely. 
Um, all right, let's see here. Let me get my pages together here. Okay, Gary, you can flip to the next page. There we go. I'd like to give uh, members an overview of what path the uh, applications take when they come into headquarters, because they don't just come directly to the genealogy department. Uh, the mail's opened, and the transmittal sheets are supposed to be in front of, on the top of the application or applications that are being submitted together is date stamped. Um, let me make one mention. If if you are doing a if you're putting in a family plan, make sure that all the members of that family are on the same transmittal. If they are on separate transmittals, that means separate application files for us to review. We pull an application. The next one that's in the drawer, we take them uh, in the order they were received. And if I take one don't know there's other ones on separate transmittals that go with it, then that's going to kind of screw things up. That other transmittals, um, the application with the second transmittal may rely on documentation with the first one, but we have no way of knowing that. So just make sure they're on the same transmittal. And it's probably a good idea to only have them, only have that one family group on a transmittal. Could be less confusing. The other thing about uh, groups of applications coming in on the same transmittal. If the if the state writes a check for the dues and fees for one check for all of the uh, applications on that one transmittal, and there's something wrong with one of those applications, missing a signature, the money's wrong, or something, that whole transmittal's worth of applications will be held up until that's resolved. So kind of bear that in mind in the way you send them in. Um, then the mail, then the applications go to uh, finance. Finance will verify the checks and and enter them into the system. Then those applications, and again, it's the transmittal, the applications, and the documentation with each application. All that follows through to genealogy, but next it goes to the registrar who enters the basic information into the database, the application database, assigns an ACN number, and uh, then we then they get into a stack that then we get in genealogy. Um, when we get them in genealogy at that point, the newly received ones, we do, we're back to doing pre-checks. We quit for a while, but I'm doing them now. I'm logging them into, we have a physical log sheet book actually. And I am, look, I'm doing a pre-check to make sure that uh, if there is a, if there's something wrong on the application, there's wrong date format, or again, another look at missing signatures and so forth. Um, I'm checking to make sure that DAR applications that are submitted are printed all, all four pages of the DAR application and the um, uh, and that they're all printed correctly. There's nothing cut off. We have a frequent problem with DAR applications being printed legal size, but on standard size paper. So they're cut off at the bottom. Need to be the whole four pages printed correctly. They can be on eight and a half by 11 or eight and a half by 14 paper, but the entire page needs to be included. Um, we, um, let's see here. And I also check for the birth certificate of the applicant, make sure that it's state's gender. And uh, generally we'll look for the parents' names on the birth certificate because invariably if the mother's name's not on there, just says Mr. and Mrs. John Smith, that doesn't really help us if the line goes through the mother. I, I always tell people when I've helped them do an SAR or DAR application that we need um, the full birth certificate, including parents' names. Some will, some particularly, um, local health departments will issue a birth certificate that only has the basic information, the name of the child and the date of birth and maybe the county location, but we need the whole, they need to be asking for the long form birth certificate um, before they give it to you. 
Um, let's see. And then we put them in a file cabinet after I've checked them in. They go in a file cabinet in the order they were received. And like I said, we pulled them out, the first one in line, and then we move them up, uh, whichever ones are um, in the order they were received, basically. So we don't go uh, moving around, pulling them from different time periods, unless there's an expedite. And I, maybe most of you are familiar with what an expedited application is, has to fit within the uh, rules of uh, allowed for expediting and has to be approved by, usually it's the executive director, the genealogist general, and the uh, chair of the genealogy committee. And then those get kind of moved to the front and taken care of. Okay, um, then we review the applications. And if they're when they're approved, we uh, uh, put them in a basket, basically, and they get picked up by a registrar who then will approve them in the database, register them, issue the certificates, uh, issue the um, the postcards that go out to the new members or the supplemental members. Supplemental still get a postcard. I'm not sure. Oh, okay, because okay. Um, and all of that is mailed by the registrar. That usually takes place once a week. Fridays. Fridays, yeah, yeah. So um, even though we might have approved an application, we don't, uh, it, it's not automatically, you know, immediate that the certificate gets sent out. The, um, once it is approved through registrar, it will, that will show up on the, uh, status report that's updated every Thursday afternoon. Um, let's see here. The those I mean those. Um, oh, and each each uh, each application that's got approved has a record copy that's enclosed for the member and for the state uh, secretary. So there's one for each and um, they can be, y'all can access those and not have to buy another record copy if you don't want to, if they're already at state level. Um, let's see here. Okay, Jeff, uh, next. Okay, I've already told you uh, a lot about this, the pre-checks, um, fees and dues, you need to make sure the money's right. I just found one that I reviewed that had the wrong, I found a couple of them recently that had the wrong amount of money uh, because there were, there are so many, there are so many different discounts and so forth that the SAR gives that it's really hard for like Kelly to even know. Kelly opens the mail and verifies the money um, and, and in finance, they do that too. But um, the, and the CAR, like CAR transfer is what I'm thinking of right now. There's not an application fee, but there is, there are dues. So, you know, if, if you ever have any question about how much money to send with an application, do uh, contact the registrar, John Toon. He, he keeps up with all that. I used to know all that, but they've changed a lot. And it's been 15 years since I was registrar here. So, um. Oh, the applications need to be correctly printed on legal sized watermarked paper, SAR watermarked paper. The front and the back both need to be at the facing the same direction, not upside down on the back. And we need to be able to read it. Make sure you look for ink that's been rubbed off. Uh, that happens a lot too, ink or toner. Um, New members, new member apps have to be have to be signed by five people: the applicant, state registrar, the state secretary, and two sponsors. In the event we get in one that doesn't have like a second line sponsor, since that's not really recorded, we usually get one of the uh, men here who are members to sign in that space. But if you want to give credit to to both people, you need to make sure they're signed by both um, both sponsors. Um, yeah, and if they're, if they, as I mentioned, with applications on a, on the same transmittal, they will be, if they don't have the, the first line sponsor, they don't have one of the necessary signatures, 
or it's printed incorrectly or doesn't have the right amount of money, it will be held up. It won't show in the status report that we have received it because it hasn't been put in the database yet. It will not get entered in the database until all that's corrected. Then it will go through finance and registrar and come back to come back to us. Anybody have any questions about any of that? Uh, Denise, one comment that I have is usually when we're missing signatures, mm -hmm. and Bobby will attest to this, it's in the middle of a uh, page or a group of them, and it's going to be like the second or third application within a group of applications that's missing a signature. So mm -hmm. when you're forwarding those to Bobby, let's put some effort into making sure you've got five signatures before you send it to him. And supplementals just require the state registrar and the member uh, signatures. But yeah, and if they're all in the same transmittal and they've come in with one check from the state, all of them will be held up. So just uh, pay close attention to that. Okay, next. Okay. Um, I think I have covered this. Um, yeah. And I've covered about all of it. The CAR transfers um, can be at any time before they, before the member, the CAR member is 22. I think it's 22. Um, they have to be a current member, dues paid member. They have to include a member in good standing certificate from CAR. And the expiration date of their dues has to be passed when they're submitting this application. And they have to have a CAR record copy to go with it. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's go to next. Yeah. Okay. Most common reasons applications are pending. A missing birth certificate, which I've gotten. And let me let me point this out since I came up, um, came across this just this week. On a couple of applications, if a if an applicant is joining on an application of a relative, let's say a father is joining on an application approved application of his son, he still has to submit a birth certificate, even though the son might have had it in his paperwork, because everybody has to. And or if it's covered on a DAR application, he still has to provide a birth certificate stating gender because we don't know on DAR applications what they took, really. I mean, you might say birth certificate, but did it say gender? So we have to, uh, we have, to have that regardless. If a, if a memorial application is being submitted, we need a death certificate. Um, let's see. These are the most common reasons, and I've covered some of these. Uh, the... And the birth certificate, if it doesn't have another's maiden name, the line goes through her, make, make uh, note of that and make sure it's on the birth certificate, her maiden name. Okay, incorrect date format. The dates, and usually this is at the top of most of the application forms. It's supposed to be typed as 01 JAN 2023, whatever. It's got to be, and it's supposed to be only the first three letters of that month. So don't spell out March or July or that kind of thing. Um, leave a space in between those numbers, which sounds ridiculous that I have to say that, but some people type them in and they don't leave any spaces and they're really hard for us to mark. Don't put slashes. Don't ever enter the dates like a uh, month, day, and year. DAR record copies, we only accept actual record copies purchased from DAR's website. We do not accept chapter copies. Um, they are Those are printed by DAR registrar, chapter registrars, and they're, they're not supposed to do that. Uh, and we will not cut DAR out of their $10 fee by uh, accepting chapter copies. You'll know the difference because of what's in the... Um, What's in the footer at the bottom of the page will say chapter copy, but you'll also know that it's a chapter copy if it has the actual first page with all the information of the applicant, all the uh, personal information and signatures and all that, 
And on the record copy purchased from DAR, they are there's a cover page with limited information, mostly about the Patriot. Uh, let's see. Another reason not providing adequate proof for parent to child connections. Make sure if you're switching to the female line that you've already proved the maiden name of the wife of the previous generation, uh, her maiden name in relation to her husband and or their children or the child that it goes through. Um, you, it will not work if you've only got a first name for her and then you pick up a last name that you've targeted in a will or something. That, that doesn't count. You have to prove her name first. Sometimes that's hard to understand. I think you have to do it a few times before you before it kind of solidifies. Oh, well, let's see. Um, plus, you have to resolve naming conflicts. You, if someone has a very common name, then getting to the next generation, whether it's her or his names, can be difficult. So make sure that you've um, dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. And then not providing proofs for the Patriots generation, we look to make sure we like to have his birth and death, or at least approximations. We really need locations. And we uh, this is all for residency purposes so that the residency where he was matches what the service uh, matches the service being claimed. Um, let's see. And that he was at the right age. He wasn't dead. And he was in the right location. So, um, okay. And when an application is pended, all communications to and from the genealogy staff are to go through the state point of contact. Please, if you are forwarding pended emails to chapters, um, don't have the chapter person or the applicant himself get in touch with us that doesn't work we'd get calls all the time it needs to any additional documentation or questions needs to go through the state point of contact in north carolina that's bobby um and then he can get with us he he has is supposed to vet whatever the additional documentation is before he sends it to us so there's a reason that we want there are several reasons we want to get uh, you all to go through bobby when you're when you have questions or you're sending something additional to us to resolve a pended email, a pended application. Are there any questions about that page, what we went through here? Okay. Next, Gary. Um, some other reasons for slow down, superfluous documentation. You know, if we have a death certificate, we really don't need typically don't need the um, Social Security death index, an obit, a um, tombstone, um, those kinds of things. Now, only, only submit those kinds of things if they add additional information. An obit might add additional information that the death certificate doesn't have. Um, or the death certificate might have something wrong on it. It's typical that the parents of the deceased, you know, when, when the informant is, is providing the information to the parents, that can sometimes get a little screwed up. And so it might have been covered in the obit. So when we have an obit, we want to have the masthead or at least the information from the masthead of the newspaper that tells what the publication was, where the publication was, and the date of the publication. Um, of course, it goes goes without saying that lineage data entered but not supported by documentation is going to take us longer. Please don't put document don't put uh, don't enter information in the lineage section that does that is not supported by documentation. It really doesn't do anybody any good, and we have to go back and second guess ourselves and look at it and say, you know, say to ourselves, did I just miss something? Or was it just put on there and it wasn't uh, wasn't supported by proof? It um, uh, I always say just put the only enter information on the on the application that's supported by documentation. 
compile the application from the documentation, not the other way around. We know we see all the time applications that are are completed and then they throw documentation at it and they don't match, even if they are close, but they don't match. So please um, inform your applicants that that's the way to do it, not the other way around. We've been told that uh, one, one state registrar told me, I'm sure that what my people are doing is going to a family tree and family in uh, Ancestry and putting the information down and then providing some documents. Doesn't work that way. So um, the incorrectly printed or unreadable documentation, We, if you can't read it, we can't read it. Um, I And I think I have some examples farther on back in this, and in this uh, presentation. But if you find an image on Ancestry or Family Search or wherever, the best way is to download the image, save the image to your computer, open it in your image, in your image editing program, <coughs> excuse me, and the, crop it, adjust the um, adjust the contrast, and then and then print it. It'll be easier to read. They'll be able to read it. We'll be able to read it. Also, remember. Excuse me. This documentation we are keeping, and we're we're it will be scanned at some point. People can order documentation, and it needs to be readable. I'm sorry, I talked too much before I took a drink. Hold on. And of course, scanning will will uh, decrease the readability a little bit anyway. So try to make them as clear as you can before we get them. Because once they're scanned, it doesn't turn out as quite as well. And think long term. Because we want these documents to be to be um, useful to other people in the future who might want to come in on uh, on a line that um, that lines up with the applications already been approved. Okay, next. Excuse me. Let's switch to the next one, Gary. Okay. This first bullet point is one that I that I just talked about. Um, I would, if I were in the position of state registrar, chapter registrar, I would have a person take a worksheet or they can print them a copy of a blank application and have them gather their documents and pencil in what they have, what that matches their uh, documentation, and then make sure they're going to do it right before you allow them to type it. Or maybe a chapter registrar needs to be typing them so they're typed correctly. If you're going to allow an applicant to do this, or even a member to do a supplemental, they need to be able to put them together like I'm explaining here. You might need to send them a uh, a, gui a little guide you make up of, you know, how to enter information, what the correct date format and location format is, not to leave out middle names or use um, or use initials when a whole name is is proven. I see that a lot. And we have to stop and write those names in. So it's really it takes us longer to do that, too. Um, again, remind them to only include data that's supported by documentation. Um, let's see here. And then bullet point three is the one I was just talking about. You have to have to look at these um, applicants to see if they're actually able to correctly complete an application themselves. Um, Also, and this last bullet point is very important, and I always try to drive this point home. If you submit, and I know sometimes state registrars get, because they've told me over the years that they get pressure sometimes or almost bullied into submitting an application that he knows is not going to fly. There's going to be problems. Remember, you are risking that applicant's um, application fee, which now is $150. It's really bad. PR for the SAR to submit those when you know they're not going to fly and then 
we have to uh, pin them. They might have to eventually get withdrawn because there was no resolution. So, you know, check these carefully before they get sent in, if, if for no other reason than that. Now I've still got 100 on this one, so it needs to be 150. <laughs> um, we did change uh, the pendant status because on this one it was still three years in pendant status. If they're if they're still here in three years, those applications will be withdrawn. But when did we start, Gary? With the with the two years, what date? Any applications that is received after the 29th of March of uh, 2024 is now subject to two years. So we're still working on the uh, supplementals. It'll be a while before the supplementals go to the two-year mark. Right, right. Um, if you, um, well, Bobby, I guess I'm talking to you primarily right now. If you send a pended email to a chapter registrar <clears throat> and when, when one of us pins an application, then they, somebody needs to set up the chapter registrar, probably uh, some kind of tickler file that warns him of the impending uh, withdrawal date. So it doesn't come up in two years and go, oh, nobody done anything on it in two years. Um, and we actually often have members or applicants themselves call us to ask what's going on with an application. They never were notified that their application was pended. So um, it's a two-way thing. It's uh, communication with national and communication with the applicant. Just make uh, make notes of which ones were pended when and yeah. follow up with them. I don't send them to the applicant. I send them to the chapter registrar uh, it goes in my database. I've got a file. I'm looking at I'm looking at the five that I have pinned. The oldest one is a supplemental. Uh, the rest of them are July 24 and forward. So we're we're whittling them down. So best we can. Yeah, that's great. We don't keep a file. We don't have a way of keeping a file like that. We don't. Our database doesn't provide for anything like that. Um, it would be nice if it had some kind of a tickler um, feature on it, but it doesn't. So it's going to be up to you guys to police your own and, um, you know, get back to the chapter registrar or the chapter registrar, get back with the applicant and see if you can get them going sooner than two or three years. Okay. All right. Next page. Okay. Uh, enter the full names of people on the in the lineage section. Don't omit or abbreviate middle names. Uh, do not include titles, ranks, or professional designations. Those are not part of the lineage. So just um, put the whole name in there if it's proven. If only an initial is proven for a middle name or what have you, it's just put the initial. Only what is proven. Uh, nicknames such as Polly for Mary, you put in, you don't put them in parentheses. Parentheses, anytime you put something in parentheses in the lineage section, that means to us that it's unproven or incorrect uh, because those are the marks we used for, we use for what is unproven or incorrect. So don't do that. For a nickname, put quotation marks. Um, for two spellings of the same name, use a slash mark, which means or, like S-M-I-T-H or S-M-Y-T-H-E, that kind of thing. That's what you're going to do for uh, different spellings of the same name. A woman who's been married previously to when she married the husband in the line, she will be Mrs., her first name, middle name, if that's proven, maiden name, than her former married surname. Uh, you don't need to put anything in brackets or all or anything. We we will figure that out. We know by the records that have been submitted. So if she were married uh, beforehand, it would be uh, 
proper to submit her previous marriage record or divorce or his death or whatever that proves she was married to someone else before she married the man in the lineage. This sometimes brings up questions. Does anybody have a question about that? No? Okay. Um, then, well, I'll mention one other thing. If she, if the husband Denise, in the lineage... Denise, I have a question. Yeah. If she's not in the lineage, if she if it's going through her husband and she's not in the lineage, why do you have to show that she was married before? Well, she is in the lineage because she's the mother. So we always say there can't be, um, you know, that you have to have two people to <laughs> have to have a mother and a father. If she was married before, it may come up in census records. It may come up if we're putting a marriage date in there for her marrying him and she was married before her previous married surname should be on the marriage record so that will reflect what was on the marriage record now if she marries subsequently her husband dies or they get divorced and she marries again but this is later you don't put the later surname on there because it that doesn't involve the lineage um, you would have to, you would need to um, account for the difference in her surname when she dies. So her, so you might want to give her subsequent marriage record and her death record to prove why she has that different surname on her death record. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Dates should be entered as day, month, and year. We already I, went over I'm that. Sorry, could I ask? A, yeah. I'm up here. Can I ask a question about the marriage that you were yep. just talking about? Sure. Uh, how about a case? I had a case where there is a, a woman married her husband. Her husband's in the lineage, and she used her pre her only name on that marriage certificate is she called herself her last husband's name. Uh, and I know from other documents that that's not her maiden name, but I don't have a record of the maiden name. So I just know on the documents that I have, that was her name and the date that she got married to her husband that is in the lineage. Uh, do right. I need to find her? I'll go all the way back somewhere and find her maiden name. Or Tyler on acid. No, you don't okay. have to. You don't have to, but I would make it since we don't have a way to indicate it. And we've been talking about this uh, for quite some time, the genealogy committee, uh, that we don't have a good way to indicate that there's that her maiden name wasn't proven. However, for instances like that, I would make a notation of that in your references that uh, and however you know that she was married before i'm not sure right um, i don't remember uh, at the moment but there was okay. yeah. and i've seen re a marriage records where they um say in the, like in the 1800s mrs you know jane smith but we don't know what her name what her maiden name was right. and it, that's all you have but and if you can't find anything else to prove it, I mean, if you could prove it, that'd be great because it might come up later. It might be helpful to somebody else who wants to join at some point. But I would make a notation of that in your reference and say, this is her married, previous married name, uh, maiden name unknown, something like that. Yeah. Okay. That also shows us that you tried to find it, that we know this was her married name and not her maiden name. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, okay, for locations. Use a two-letter uppercase abbreviation for state names. Don't spell them out, please. Um, if it, we, you know, we have limited room. I'm sure you all know from completing applications. There's not that much room in each field. Um, to indicate it's county, we're not doing that anymore. Just do the, um, they're not putting CO do just the city, county, state, and I've given you, do I have you some examples here? Yes. 
if you're only entering a you've only proven accounting in state the example is slash jefferson slash kentucky that means jefferson county kentucky if you're only entering a city in a state but no county don't go adding the county just because you know it we have to take only what's on the documentation um so you're going to have example is louisville slash slash kentucky it says we know it's a town and the state but we but it wasn't proven uh the county wasn't proven and then if you just have um if you just have if you have all three it's louisville slash jefferson slash kentucky if all you have is a state just put the state abbreviation okay leave all unknown or non-applicable fields completely blank don't put na don't put unc or unknown or or living or any of that because living is kind of redundant on the earlier generations just leave them blank that will be totally fine with us uh, you're going to have to cite all your sources in the lit in the reference section please don't describe what the proof is telling us because we know when we read them you don't have to spell out that this census proves that so-and-so is a child of so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and they're living here and there again there's a space consideration on these applications to um to be aware of uh let's see when an sar dar application is being submitted for proof you're going to put dar or sar number whatever the number is and then the patriot's name and the reason you're putting the Patriot's name and not the member's name, which we see a lot, is because one member can have different Patriots and we, we're we only looking at the application based on the lineage from a certain Patriot. So we want to uh, delineate them that, by Patriot. Um, proof all the applications for accuracy, just like if you were typing something, uh, you know, a report go back maybe the next day and look, compare them each with your, uh, with the documentation. You can um, uh, make a paper copy of the application and review them like we do and go check off everything from the, from the, app, from the documentation when compared to the application. And you can, um, uh, you can make a little mark in between each time you, you uh, have made a connection between one generation and the next. That way you know where you are as you're going down. You should not have any um, missing connections if you do that that way. You, as you prove one connection to the next, put a mark of some kind in there. That's the way we do it here. Okay, so um, go to the next one, Gary. So I was talking about downloading images to a computer, then cropping them, adjusting the brightness. Don't use the print button from the image on that you find on one of these uh, genealogy websites, because you're going to get a skewed image. You're going to want, I use a Microsoft Office Picture Manager, which is, I think, quickly becoming obsolete. I think it's another one of those things that Microsoft's now going to want you to rent. So <laughs> not thrilled with that. But there are other free ones. Some of the people in our department use Irfan View, I-R-F-A-N View. Um, but you'll need a basic, you'll need a basic image program in order to, you know, crop the black uh, border from censuses and all kinds of other uh, other documents. And you, it also saves you some ink. And print them big enough that we can read them. You know, there's no reason that a that a landscape uh, image such as a 1920 census should be printed portrait on an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper because it's going to shrink it down to about a third the size, and then we can't read it very well. Wills, wills, deeds, those kinds of things need to be printed one page at a time. If you've gone on to, well, you get to them from Ancestry a lot of times now, but gone on to Family Search and you found the books that you have to literally flip through online, you're going to get a double page spread image. Go ahead, download that, 
crop to one side, print that page, then crop to the other side and print that page. If we're reading two legal size pages uh, basically joined together on one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, sometimes they're only half using half a page. It's very hard to read. So again, we have to go in and we have to stop and reprint those ourselves, or we get back to you, pin the application, and say, you're going to have to print these so that we can read them. We'd really rather not do that. Um, so keep that in mind. <laughs> um, the same printing is going to go for full pages of text from books. Print them one page at a time. Include the title page of the book so that we have the um, publication date. Tombstones need to include the place of burial, the cemetery name, and the location. Doesn't necessarily mean the location in the cemetery, but the location as in county and state, city, county, state. Um, that gives us some context for those. They also have to be period appropriate. They can't be a tombstone that somebody put up and you know, erected in 1970, and it was for somebody who died 200 years ago. We we don't take those. We also don't take um, find a grave memorial pages that don't have a tombstone. You can print the memorial page and print the tombstone larger on a separate page or on the back if you want, but um, we need to be able to read the tombstone and we need to be able to see the location of the tombstone. We There is no reason to underline Anything on the um, on the memorial page that has been that is user entered, uh, the which includes the uh, other kinship or other people who have memorial pages. Those don't mean anything to us. Those are user entered. They can put anything in there. So only a period appropriate readable tombstone and the location of the cemetery. Or what we take now some people do upload pictures of uh or images like a obituary or they've transcribed an obituary that has a the masthead information the, the the publication's name and location and date those are all those are acceptable we will take those okay next gary <clears throat> okay so this, I'm telling you how to print the census pages. So from 1850 to 1880, those censuses should be printed in a portrait orientation. Now, most of us, uh, at least my computer here and at home, selects the right orientation to print it at, but these are much more readable than ones that are printed incorrectly. So that's 1850, 60, 70, and 80 should be a portrait. Go to the next page, Gary. The 1900 census is virtually square. Sometimes, depending on how it's cropped, it'll print for me one way or the other, but it's it doesn't um, uh, make the image any less harder to read if it's printed one way or the other. But cropping it helps. Okay, next. 1910, 20, 30, and 40. Should be printed in landscape orientation. You get the most out of that, um, most out of the image if you do it that way. Then next is 1950, and it's back to portrait. Um, so you put them that way, you're going to get the best images. Okay, next page. So this was an 1860 census I got, or 1880 census I got one time. That's from printing it using the browser button rather than downloading it and saving it to your computer. Anybody read that? <laughs> it's the squibbles. Yeah, I know. And then I've got, Greg, go ahead and flip to the next page. And I've got two more examples of that. Okay, now this one, okay, this is a certificate, a death certificate. The death certificate on the left is the or the image on the left is the one I received. I couldn't read it, just like you can't read it. Then I downloaded it and um, cleared, cleared up the, uh, the the contrast and so forth. And that's the image. Now the one on the right, I assume everybody would rather have than the one on the left. And again, if you can't read it, we can't read. 
Okay, next. This is actually my uh, grandparents' uh, marriage record. It's on. It's the one on the left hand page. So you go. You're gonna. And I had to at that time. It wasn't field searchable, and I had to download it. So um, I had. I'm, I'm sorry. I had to search for it on Family Search and look through the books. So this is what I came came up with. Actually, I had already done this by going across the river and getting it from uh, the uh, Clark County Courthouse. But this is the way it's going to look if you're doing it online. So you get one of these. You, so on this one, I wanted to crop away. I cropped away the one on the right over to the one on the left. So go to the next page, Gary. And this is much more readable. This is a, a legal sized piece of paper. So, you know, putting two of those side by side on eight and a half by 11 page is not going to be readable. So, this is just an example of what I was talking about in cropping to one side or the other. And they're generally going to be legal sized pages, whether it's a marriage record like <laughs> this or a or a will or, or a state record, deed. They're all going to be legal sized pages. So, let's make them print them download and print them to where they're most usable. Okay, next, Gary. This is what I was saying about um, reviewing applications like we do. This is going to be, a, this is going to allow you to make sure your applications are ready to go before submitting them to, well, your state registrar and then to national. So you make a plain paper copy that you can mark on. Don't mark on the original uh, printed app. Place the documents beside it. Then flip through each document, place a check mark over each individual piece of datum as they're verified by each document. Like I said earlier, when a parent-child connection is proven with your documentation, Place a vertical mark, anything that will tell you that I, between the two generations that you have made that connection, you have that solid um, with documentation, proven with documentation. Do that first before you move to the next generation's proofs. Um, and again, when switching to the female line, her name must be proven before you connect her to her parents. Omit any data that is not proven by documentation. Um, and any that are any data that's been entered that uh, is incorrect, go ahead and correct that. This is all done before you print the final copy. This will help you later. Um, when you're using an SAR or DAR application as proof, you need to be able to you you need to check off the same uh, data that was approved on that previous SAR DAR application. If something has been bracketed, um, then you're going to leave that out. Like I said earlier, omit any data that's not proven by documentation. So you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing on those that the previous application had uh, on the new application. You're gonna to need to incorporate that, uh, those corrections um, you're either going to need to omit documentation or omit data that wasn't proven, just like on the previous application, or you're going to need to uh, co make corrections to agree with that previous paper. I've had ones before that I don't know where, you know, I have the documentation sitting there, I'm reviewing an application, and everything's different than in the documentation. I have no explanation for that. That's you Huh. And he's, uh, that I find that's a problem when they're, when they're doing a supplemental, but they don't go back and look at their original application that was proven by SAR, and they just put on the same thing they had on their one that was corrected. So that that's an issue. I've seen that, and what happens in a lot of those, Bobby, is that there I can tell because they've just. Got, they've just downloaded a copy of their previous application before all the markings were done, all the corrections were made, and they used that one. Meanwhile, we're making the same corrections on the new one that we'd already made on the older one. So that's a huge time waster for us. 
So they need to start clean. I mean, if they want to pull up a previous application, they need to uh, make all the changes, um, changes and omissions that were on that previous um, record copy. So just make sure that those are done because we, I mean, I've had some, and then their family apps come in where all of them need to be redone. That and that's just unnecessary waste of time for us in uh, trying to decrease the turnaround time. Um, and I had one fellow one time, oh, maybe a year or two ago, who was a state president and the uh, registrar for his chapter, and he told me he didn't know that. I mean, it's common sense to us that you would make the changes, but he said he wasn't aware of that. So you're aware of this now. Um, verify the Patriot's data is entered correctly and consistent with proving service. Like I said earlier, we need to know, we need to have context for his service. So we need to have dates and places surrounding him, including him, including maybe the where the child, uh, line through child's born and when, and maybe his marriage, all the things that add into, add up to um, giving context to where he was and the age he was to coincide with the service. Um, okay, at the top of the application, there's a description of service that says he's, you know, operates in the operating in the capacity of. That's where you're going to spell out the service. Service description is not patriotic service, civil service, military service, whatever. It's going to be a description of service. This does not have to be a paragraph like from mass soldiers and sailors. Most applications seriously come in with a DAR application. I like to use the DAR description as a model. And um, there's this kind of brief, but it'll have from military service generally their uh, commanding officer's name and so forth, but not uh, a lot of other stuff. We also just don't want the abbreviation for private and the abbreviation for a state. That doesn't, that doesn't set him apart from other people. So look at what DAR has kind of follow that kind of pattern. We'll make corrections here if it's not right. Now, in the proof of service, the references for the service, that's not where you put the description of service. We, we often see the description of service where the reference is supposed to go or the reference and the, and the description of service. So those are two separate fields and they need to be treated as two separate fields. One is the description of service, one is the proof of service. They seem to get, this seems to be a real common uh, issue that I see. I don't know if anybody has any questions about why, why they, or our comments about why that happens. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, you can read this last bullet point. Um, yeah, if um, if we're using a DAR application, you're going to want to say, and we're using that as proof of service or as our source for the proof of service, you're going to put DAR number so-and-so cites and then cite the, the proof, the reference that DAR has, okay? On SAR applications, you don't really have to say SAR so number so-and-so uh, cited this, that, and the other, because we have those, we already have those pages here. So just put what that proof of service was. And I kind of use the model again of how DAR does it. On DAR, um, if, if I were constructing a DAR application and you get to the proof of service and it relied on another application that had the proof of service on it, you don't put DAR number so-and-so. I was corrected by my chapter registrar one time a long time ago. You don't put that. You just type in the proof of service, even though you're not submitting it again. Okay, let's look to the next page. So this is how, this is a dummy application, and um, this is how we mark applications. So let's say <clears throat> we're looking at generation one. We have a birth certificate. We have her birth certificate. We have the marriage certificate. And... I've filled in all those blanks, and on his birth certificate, it names his parents. So 
that's what I've got for generation one. I've made my little line down here between one and two, checked off the parents' names. Then we can move to the next generation's uh, documentation. So if you flip the page again, now we've gotten the uh, documentation for generation two and it connects, <clears throat> it connects the mother of the applicant to the to her parents so i've got <clears throat> excuse me all of their data generation two's data checked off and generation two the wife of generation two <clears throat> uh her documentation spelled out her parents names so that way i know i've got down to generation three now and go to the next page And this is the same thing for generations three to four. This is how you're going to review applications before you send them to us to make Gary, sure everything is right. Gary needs to flip the pages. Oh, <laughs> which page? Okay, so we're down to, we've got the generation four. We're stopping generation four. Are we on the right page? Yeah, and then the next page is a reference page. Okay. Um, you can see I've listed all the references there. This was at the first couple of generations on this application are made up names, but this is actually an application I did, an SAR application I did for my boyfriend's brother who lives in Atlanta and um, which went through. So <laughs> I know. So, um, and then you can see how I listed the DAR uh, reference that, DAR cites Kegley. Uh, that's the way that it should be done if you're using a DAR application for the, their proof of service. That way we can always, you know, some people say, well, why can't we just put the DAR number in there? Well, that doesn't tell me anything. If we have to track back, we should know what that proof of service was because DAR, they've got the proof. Of they've got all that documentation at their headquarters. We don't have it here. So we need to be able to track back, particularly in cases of men of the same name, we have to go back and look at documentation from an application 10 years from now. And um, we want to be able to have as many clues as we can. Okay, so. Okay, Gary, you want to flip again? Okay, so this page on the website, on SAR's website has, uh, if you go up to genealogy and gene, click on genealogy resources, there's a number of, of uh, presentations, uh, training and so forth, including this one that was recorded uh, when I did the one for Georgia Society. And um, it's on there under genealogist general forum number seven, but there are all kinds of, of pieces in here. There's one on how to print documentation correctly, although it's probably a little outdated um, as far as the uh, um, genealogy websites, uh, uh, what I want to say, buttons are concerned. You know, they, they've changed them a little bit over time, their commands. So, but you get the, you'll get the gist of that. Um, you know, just there's a lot of information that you don't even have to leave your computer to see. To And I would suggest that all your chapter registrars look at these. And the ones who weren't able to attend today, I would recommend that you send it out to them, uh, Bobby, maybe, and tell them, please do this to help our, <laughs> to help our state's application. Okay, anybody have questions, anything? I don't have, this is Bob Ainsley from Newburn. I don't have a question or anything, but I, a, a, well, I do, but let me make a few comments, if you don't mind, before I do that. Certainly. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Gary, Bobby, uh, Denise, thank you for, for doing this. Um, every mm -hmm. time I go through something like this, I pick up a nugget or two that uh, oh. helps. It really does, That's and good. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Uh, I have a question. Uh, and recently we had an application, and Gary helped me with this one. 
where we had a, a son who wanted to come in on his dad's application that was an SAR approved. And we were able to fast track that, which made a lot of sense. Okay, if you think about it, um, it was an issue out of Virginia. We decided to help out Virginia on that one. So that, that worked pretty well. But if you stop and think about applications like that one, at least this is how I think about it, you've got an already approved application from a father. Now the son wants to come in. Is there mm -hmm. some way we could figure out a policy by which you don't have to wait 12 weeks, 17 weeks, whatever it's taking you to turn the application around to make that work? And that's well, something I would just throw on the table for consideration down the road. Right. So you said that you did one that was fast track. What do you mean by fast track? I didn't wait 12 weeks to get it approved. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, did somebody have it expedited? Yes. Uh, no. Oh, okay. It, it had took... been. Go ahead, Gary. I'm sorry. Yeah. To do something like you're talking about, Bob, it has to be approved by me, by the chairman of the genealogy committee, and by the executive director. And that's that's called an expedited activity. And it has to make logical sense to the three of us as opposed to, well, Bobby's a good guy, and I'm just going to send one in because he asked me to do it. Uh, we, we've got to, we, we've got a little bit of a a requirement in the SAR that we're just not going to do it for everyone because everybody would find a way to expedite their applications. Go I ahead, think Bobby. the one Bob's talking about is one that was, had not been handled in Virginia and been stagnated for a year. And Bob jumped in and Gary, you got that one moved up because that guy had been waiting a year for his application to be submitted or something like that. Yeah, and that's and I appreciate that. I really do. But it goes, and I I understand you got policy and all that up there. Uh, all all I'm saying is, when when you got an application, a father was approved. He's already gone through the 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 ringer, and has been approved. He's he's been a member for five or six years. Now the son wants to come. It's just a simple thing of getting the documents for Gen One now the son and tying it to the SAR application of the approved dad. Uh, right. you know, it, it, uh, normally you're going to have to put that in the queue mm -hmm. and you got 12 weeks or better. And I'm just right. saying, consider, I'm not, you know, I'm just saying, think about this. Well, to, the to other us thing, down here in the cheap seats, it doesn't make sense to wait 12 weeks to get something like that approved. Yeah. And, um, but the problem, Bob, is that there are a lot of other people with the same, in the same situation or somebody's trying to get their sons and grandsons into the uh, into the SAR. There are so many of those. There's not a way to parse that out, yeah. barely. Um, we can't, you know, the best thing to do is have them all come in at the same time. <laughs> well, like, it does, it, Denise, you know yourself, it doesn't always happen that way. I I, I'll stop. I got my two cents on that one. <laughs> um, I know when I'm up against the wind. Uh, number three, um, I really like the way you've taken this and given me examples of how things ought to be printed and the like. It would be very helpful, I think, down the road when you get free time, Denise. Um, <laughs> maybe as a death, put, put this, embed this within as a, either as a supplement to the existing genealogy manual so that we could use it as a desk reference so that when folks are, you know, it's a reminder, if nothing else, to say, Oh, crap. You know, I, I remember we did this several, you know, I, I had to cite this this way several applications back, but now I've got, I've forgotten about it. It would be nice to have something like that as a desk reference that we could all kind of go to. Um, you mean so this, I, I like that. This particular presentation or the one on how to print correctly? That It's, it's along that same line of how to print correctly. It, that's a nice little tool that you know we could fall back on and it's very helpful if you haven't done this before and you have a law in the last time since you printed it and, and bobby beats up on me every now and then when i forgot to print them on both sides so um you know <laughs> well <laughs> he keeps me straight or he tries to keep me straight so kind of a thing anyway well, i i appreciate it you know just think about that that might be very helpful for us here in trying to work through a lot of these things well gary might have some ideas on that how to do that um it's kind of why we put all these presentations under genealogy resources on the website. Um, you can print them out if you want and use them, hand them out to your uh, chapter registrars and so forth. Um, 
the um and in on genealogy resources on that part of the page the web page uh, there is one on how to correctly print documentation that's the first that is the first presentation i did <clears throat> after i joined the the genealogy staff 12 years ago i have yeah. a background in graphics and yeah. so it's always kind of easy for me to to use these simple programs. Um, yeah. But it's also going to depend on the, I know it's easy for us because we do it all the time. It's going to depend on the level of expertise that your registrars have, the um, also the whatever the image program they use. You know, now they're, you know, like I was saying, there's, there are a few different image programs that are actually very simple. So just so that you can crop and uh, rotate and and adjust the brightness and contrast, those kinds of things, those are what we generally use the most. And yeah. it does a tremendous uh, service to to have these have these documents readable. A lot of people don't know how to do that, so it'd be hard for me. I can show you examples, which is uh, which are covered in that how to print documentation correctly. Um, um, in that presentation, but until you work somebody with somebody who is actually working on with a program that they they have on their computer, it'd be hard for me to teach them exactly how or the mechanics of doing it. But I can show them correctly printed applications and so forth, like I have in that one presentation. Yeah, if that now, makes sense. Uh, that this presentation uh, that we're seeing today is that something I can download? Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. I'll go in. I'll, I'll go in and download it, and I'll just put it on my desk. Um, and the last thing, uh, resources uh, as far as um, um, getting the right resources sometimes is very difficult. Uh, I'll give you a case in point. We're working one. I've even got the the genealogy committee uh, head is helping us on this one. Uh, it's one of those tough nuts to crack kind of a thing. Uh, here's where we're trying to, um, I think it's Gen 7 to Gen 8, the Patriot. Uh, th this this fellow moved around quite a bit, was even in Canada for a while. So finding the right primary source document uh, out of New York and Canada is, is kind of a challenge sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and still is <laughs> for this one. Um, right. So uh, is there... Is there a one-stop shopping place that we can go for uh, things that we could have access to, like an online kind of a compendium of all the resources available? I know they're all over the map, kind of a thing. No, I wish there were. Um, yeah. you no, know, it's you know we use Ancestry.com, we use Family Search, we use any HGS's website, which is a member member based uh, website, which is uh, AmericanAncestors.org. Um, what we use Fold Three. We check various various uh, online sources, but we also <clears throat> have we we recently, well, within the year, I don't know if you're aware of it. Family Search has a um, full text um, AI generated. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. So, that's getting uh, better. Have, I know. We have really resolved a lot with that. Uh, Deborah did a presentation on that at uh, leadership, this past leadership. And I have an article in the previous, I guess it was the last uh, SAR magazine, just on some basics on it. it. If you haven't tried it, please do. But we really, I wish there was a one-stop shop, but we really will scour different websites to come up with what we need. Yeah. Well, that's it, Denise, for me. Warren, did you have anything? Hi, right, Bob. Okay. Bobby, thanks again. George, Gary, thanks again. Appreciate you guys doing this. Anybody else have questions, Bobby? I haven't heard any, but, you know, uh, I want to thank my guys for being on here today. Uh, some of the ones who needed to be here weren't, but we, this video has been recorded, so I'm going to send, send the video link out to, to all the chapters. I, I've got a mailing list for that. But um, we're, we're trying hard. You know, we've whittled down our pendants you know, from what they were down to five, and two of them, I think, you know, one that you and I talked about, Denise, i just gone back and said, hey, guys, it's time to do a replacement. So... Uh, I think we've done I think we've done four or five replacements this year that I have all gotten approved. So 
guys, that, you know, when you when you finally beat your head against the wall enough, that's the option. You got a period of time to do that. The fee, there's no fee to submit a replacement application. So you've saved your applicant money. So think about that rather than just continuing to beat your head against the wall. Uh, sometimes it just, you know, it's easier. And you want to do it before the time runs out because you exactly. don't want to waste your applicant's application fee. Yeah. And that goes away. I and mean, they don't get the application yeah. fee back because it has been used by a review. Yeah. And I want to thank the guys for being on today. Gary, thank you. And Denise, for giving us well, your time this afternoon. You and I have had lots of conversation and, and I appreciate you. I'm proud of what you do. And you you go way beyond the extra mile a lot of times and have done that over the last 10 or 12 years for me and bailed me out. So thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Glad to help. All right. Anybody else? Questions? If you ever have a question, you want to email me or Gary or whatever, um, please do. I'll try to help. Okie dokie. Well, anybody? Jared, Gary? Now, the only thing that I will add to this is, uh, Bob, when you have those, Bob Ainsley, when you have those recommendations for updating the application preparation guide, perhaps we could send it to the genealogy committee. They have a subcommittee that actually updates that guide. And I think we'll have an update sometime in December. Hopefully, uh, some of the concepts that you had uh, will be included in there. But it may be timely to say, we'd like to see this in the application preparation guide to that committee. So well, I'll do that. Basically, what, what uh, Denise has laid out here today gave us some good examples of how to print those uh, U.S. Census, for example, and I'm thinking to make it as easy as you possibly can, you would just simply put it as a supplement to. That makes it easier to change and revise over time as you make a supplement to. Right. Good idea, Bob. Well, thank you All very righty. much for, for everybody participating. This has been uh, Denise Hall presenting how you can make approval-ready applications. Let's do that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Denise. Appreciate it. Bye.